Good afternoon, everyone. Chris Tarabasi here welcoming you to the annual Cultural Competency Program. Thank you for participating. Um, I'm happy to introduce Ms. Gail Price Wise. She will be our speaker today. Just some information about Gail. She is uh, she's the founder and president of the Florida Center for Cultural Competency. Uh, she is actually a physical therapist in her early days um, and received her master's in health policy and management from Harvard. Uh, she is has an incredible resume. Uh, she's presented and consulted nationally and internationally. Very excited about her presentation today, and I hope you will agree once you hear her. Um, just as an administrative note, we will be accepting questions in the chat box. Occasionally, we'll be stopping to poll questions. We really would like to make this an interactive program to the best that we can. So we're encouraging questions uh, via the chat box. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gail Price Wise and take it away, Gail. Great. Well, first of all, thank you so very much for in inviting me to come and speak with you today. I'm very excited about this opportunity and love this topic. Um, I just love talking about cultural competence and it's very dear to my heart. So thank you again for the opportunity. So, um, okay, so we're going to be talking about cultural competence in healthcare and I put it here as part one because cultural competence is a, is a complicated topic that has lots and lots of factors to it. And we're gonna be just really just scratching the surface of it today. <clears throat> okay, so um, you're going to laugh. Um, I actually, after an introduction, I apologize. And the reason I apologize is that in the course of the next hour, we're going to be talking about topics that may make you uncomfortable. We'll talk about issues of bias and prejudice and racism and feelings about different ethnic groups. And at times, I may accidentally say or do something that makes someone uncomfortable. And if that happens, I, I hope that you'll put something in the chat and let me know. And again, I apologize in advance. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm going to start um, with a little story. You can see that I have here a picture of a syringe. Um, so this is a real story of something that happened, unfortunately. Um, a, a father brought a child in, an, an infant, into the doctor's office, and that child had uh, an ear infection, right? Common ear infection. And as the story goes, the, um, the, the child was given an antibiotic. And I, as I understand it, they were given like a pre-filled syringe that would require the, doc, the, the, the father to simply put the syringe in the baby's mouth and push it a little bit to push some of the antibiotic into the child's mouth. So it seems pretty uh, uh, clear and pre pretty easy to do. So um, the doctor explained this to the father the father went home and at the designated time, put the syringe in the baby's mouth and pushed the plunger. And suddenly that baby stopped breathing and um, began to turn blue. Um, the father rushed the baby to the emergency room at the hospital and that baby very sadly was dead on arrival. And when they, um, examined the baby, they found the syringe cap in the trachea. So the dad, who was not familiar with syringes, didn't understand that it had a cap on it that needed to be removed. So, you know, this was clearly a, a tremendous tragedy. And when we, we think about that, why did that happen? And it happened to a large extent because there was insufficient communication and education of it the dad. And in this case, the dad didn't know what he didn't know. And he also didn't have the kind of confidence or the relationship with the doctor to say, you know what, I don't know that I know how to do this, or I'm not comfortable with this, or I have a question, I'm not sure that I understand this properly. And because that didn't happen, sadly, that that baby, that baby died. So you know, we're gonna be talking a lot about communication. Now communication, of course, is important with all of your patients. It's particularly difficult or challenged when the family doesn't speak English as first language, or if they don't understand sort of American medicine, how things work, 
or in many cases, immigrant and refugees, immigrants and refugees may feel intimidated by American providers and may be less likely to say, I don't understand, or can you please explain that to me again? So the, the asking the question, do you understand? Do you understand what I said? The problem with it is no one says no. <laughs> No one says no, and likely in the case of this very unfortunate baby that died, um, I would suspect that the provider did ask the father, do you have any questions? And the father just simply didn't say no. So there's a whole issue around trust. It's extremely important to create a relationship with patients in which the patients and their, their families should feel comfortable saying, I don't understand. I need another, I need more information about this. And, and as I said, this is very important, of course, with all of your patients, but in the case of um, people who have come from overseas, people who are refugees, who have had bad experiences, or in many uh, parts of the world, there is an enormous like um, social um, division between educated physicians and the kind of common uh, person who you'd be likely to see. And, and because of that, they may simply feel intimidated and have a sense that they don't have the right or don't have the courage to to engage you in a conversation when they're having trouble understanding something. <clears throat> so um, this is a book that I wrote, um, An Intoxicating Error. And um, the young man um, uh, on the left, excuse me, the right hand corner, that, that's him at 18. And, um, and then you can see he's sitting in a wheelchair, he's quadriplegic. So um, essentially, this is a real case that happened in South Florida where a young man, uh, 18 years old, um, entered a hospital and he was unconscious at the time that he, he actually was picked up by an ambulance and was brought to um, a, a, the hospital unconscious. And um, his family had spoke broken English, but a couple of the family members spoke pretty well. There was a 15-year-old girlfriend that spoke English very well. And there was um, like a, a, a the girlfriend's mother who spoke English well enough to communicate, and they explained to the doctor that he had fallen down uh, unconscious um, and that he was intoxicado. And in in Spanish, intoxicado sounds like intoxicated. So the um, the doctor assumed what had happened is that the the um, young man had was intoxicated and since there was no alcohol uh, clearly um, in his breath they assumed that he had taken a drug overdose and the girlfriend the 15 year old girlfriend um, it was introduced as the girlfriend but she said no 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 we used to be boyfriend and girlfriend but you know we um, had a fight a couple of days ago and we're not boyfriend any and girlfriend anymore and the physician took that to understand that they had they had, had a, a painful breakup and that what had happened was Willie, his name is Willie Ramirez, had taken an intentional drug overdose. And that's what they treated him for. They treated him for an intentional drug overdose. Um, a, a day and a half later, 30, 36 hours later, he had, a, he had a, a respiratory arrest and he was transferred to another hospital uh, and I should say this is 1978 where there were not very many um, CAT scanners. So he was transferred to a hospital that had a CAT scanner. And what they found was an intracerebellar aneurysm and that the, the, the um, hematoma was so large that it, it pushed his brain stem over to the side. And um, as I understand it, the foramen magnum, it was there was too much pressure on it and he was left quadriplegic. Um, so the, why did this happen? It's so crazy, right? What happened that day was he had had a Wendy's hamburger and after the Wendy's hamburger, he f fell down unconscious. And the family was trying to explain that he was food poisoned, that in Cuban Spanish, intoxicado does not mean intoxicated. It has nothing to do with alcohol abuse. It has nothing to do with, um, with a drug overdose. They thought he was food poisoned they thought because he had eaten a Wendy's hamburger, they thought to themselves, see, that's what happens when you eat bad food in a fast restaurant, you fall down unconscious. For them, it made, it made total sense. The girlfriend arguing about the, uh, the fact that 
the she and the boyfriend had broken up was completely a red herring, completely unrelated to anything. It's just that 15 year olds um, think that the world revolves around them. And so she tells a story that is completely irrelevant. So essentially, he had had a brain aneurysm that was not picked up for almost two days because the family had told this story about him being intoxicated and the girlfriend had told us this stupid story about them breaking up. And when it was finally discovered that no, what he really had was a brain aneurysm, the um, neurosurgeon did, you know, basically did surgery. And I talked to that neurosurgeon uh, near, nearly 30 years later. And in the law suit, he testified that had he been called in earlier that he likely would have been able to have prevented Willie from becoming quadriplegic. The, um, the settlement was $71 million. It was uh, the largest or one of the largest in Florida's history. And Willie now is actually living a pretty good life, as, as good as you can for somebody that's quadriplegic. <clears throat> so um, I want to talk about uh, why that happened. Um, I've talked to the doctor, the emergency room doc, for, doctor. First of all, there was an interpreting error, and they should have had an interpreter. And even though they had a couple of people that spoke reasonably well, they didn't understand that there was something called a false cognate or a false friend, where two words sound very similar, but they are completely different in, in terms of meaning. <clears throat> the provider um, who I talked to, the emergency room doctor, said, you know, he was honest with me. He said this was a Cuban family, a Hispanic family, a young man. For him, it made sense that this was a drug overdose. Um, I talked to the Cuban family. They felt very intimidated by the American doctor. In fact, they knew that Willie would never do drugs. And they said they found that the, the diagnosis of a drug overdose was ridiculous, didn't make any sense at all to them. But they didn't have the guts to say to this American doctor, we think you're wrong. We don't think that Willie did drugs. We think there's another problem here. This doesn't make any sense to us. And so sadly, the provider, the emergency room doctor said to me, quote, if the family had only told me that my son never does drugs, I would have looked for something else. I would have, I would have done something else. I would have looked for another explanation for why he was unconscious. Um, the last thing I'll say about the story is that um, there was a Bolivian doctor, a, a, a Bolivian doctor who became, who was the attending. Once the emergency room doctor admitted him, or rather passed him upstairs, there was, a, there was an attending doctor who was a native Spanish speaker, a Bolivian doctor. And so this is another thing that I want to leave you with is that there's enormous variety <laughs> in any group of people that you're working with. So if somebody is Hispanic, don't assume that there's a kindred spirit between the Cubans and the Bolivians. There's not. Or wherever you are in the world, between um, people of different parts of Africa or different parts of Eastern Europe or within Central America versus South America, there's enormous differences in the language that people use and how they feel about each other. So in this particular case, this was a Bolivian doctor who had been a member of the aristocracy in Bolivia. He was very contemptuous of Cubans. He thought their Spanish was really bad. He thought they made a lot of noise. They were too loud. He never engaged them in a conversation to say, can you tell me what happened? He never engaged them in that conversation. And um, anyway, that would have made a difference also. That would have made a difference if they had gotten a, a full, accurate medical history, but they did not. <clears throat> so I want to talk about prejudices because this, um, in the, in the case of the um, the the doctor that saw Willie, he clearly had a prejudice. He prejudged him and made assumptions, and there was enormous prejudice between the Bolivian doctor and the Cuban family on both sides. I talked to both of them, and they did not like each other. And so I want to say something about prejudices, and I will start by saying that we all have them. And if you don't, you're not human. What is natural for human beings is to divide the world into us and them. These are my people. These are not my people. These are the people I'm comfortable with. These are the people I'm not comfortable with. We all do it, and, and we do it for a variety of reasons. So... <clears throat> 
I want you, I'm going to show you a few slides and I want you to um, look at the slides and then silently answer whether the person is honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar. So this woman, I want you to be honest with yourself. Is she honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? This gentleman, is he honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? This gentleman, honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? This woman, honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? This fellow, honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? This man, honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? So for most of you, I would say that for most of you, something popped into your head or you had a reaction or a feeling about these people just based on what they look like. And what do we know about them? Do we know what they do for a living? Do they know whether they're good to their children or whether they beat their children? We don't know anything about them. And yet most of us will have a reaction, an assumption about them just basically based on what they look like. So I, you know, remember I apologized at the beginning, and so I'm going to tell you something about me. The fellow here with the sleeve, the tattoos, I, I apologize, but that uh, presentation is something that I'm very uncomfortable with. So when I see somebody with the gauges or the pet tattoos or um, a lot of piercings, I'm uncomfortable with that person, and and I have a, I have a tough time. Um, assessing them as an individual. If, if somebody um, that fit that uh, description came and, and was looking for a job at my company, I would have a hard time with it. So I'm not saying anything bad about him. I'm telling you that because of what I do for a living, I'm constantly asking myself, who are the groups of people that I'm uncomfortable with? Who are the groups of people that I am pre-judging, that I'm making an assessment about before I know them? And I would say that this, this fellow with this sleeve is, is, for me, meets that, meets that category. And I would assert that for all of you sitting there, there is something, some group of people that gives you what I call that yuck feeling. Now, perhaps it's related to the color of their skin or whether they have an accent or what they dress like or whether they're missing teeth or whether they're obese or whatever it is, what their religion is. I would guess there is some group of people that makes you uncomfortable and makes you uncomfortable out there in the world and would make you uncomfortable with a patient and a family, would might make you uncomfortable with your coworker or whatever, and that it will influence how you feel and how you interact with that person. <clears throat> I will tell you that, um, you know, I call this, let's see if I have it in the next one. I don't call it eliminating your prejudices because it's very difficult to do it. It is very difficult to eliminate your prejudices. I call it managing your prejudices and that's what we're going to talk about. So I want to say that there's no such thing as a first impression. There's no such thing as a first impression for adults. If you have a reaction to somebody that looks like this, it's almost always because they remind you of somebody that you've met in the past, someone that you saw on TV, somebody that your mother told you about. So when I see the fellow that has a lots of tattoos and piercings and such, that reminds me of something that has bothered me, that somebody somebody that I met that, that scared me in the past or somebody that I saw on TV, I am not interacting with that specific individual. And that's something that I try to remind myself of. Or it's something somebody that your mother told you to be careful about those people, people that look like that. <clears throat> so there's no such thing as a, in a first impression. When you're having a reaction to somebody, it's almost always, if you're having a gut feeling about them, it's because they remind you of somebody else. And notice that prejudice, the word prejudice comes from pre-judge. It means to make an assessment about someone before you know them, when you don't know anything about them. <clears throat> So I'm going to read this list to you, and I want you to pick two off the list. You can remember it, or you can write it down. So people with blonde hair, people with bad teeth, people with elegant clothing, gay people, obese people, people with tattoos, short people, people who speak with an accent, or people with different clothing, like a sari or a, or a headscarf. You know, a sari is like um, something that an Indian woman would wear. <clears throat> 
And um, then I want you to finish the sentence. So here, if you pick uh, short people, and I can say that I'm five, one and a half. Um, so I want you to then finish the sentence. So you might say short people and then pick the things that is, you know, jumps into your head, that pops into your head, that they're lazy, they're intelligent, they're selfish, they're hardworking, they're dangerous, they're kind, they're dirty, they're like me, they're very different from me, or they're ugly. So again, pick two off of this list, and then I want you to finish the sentence with two from this list. So um, most of you would have noticed something that came into your head. That is your unconscious talking to you. You can say, hello, unconscious. You're unconscious whether you know it or not. In fact, by definition, it's unconscious, so you wouldn't know it. But um, it talks to you all day long. All day long, you're walking down the street and you are unconsciously saying, oh, that person looks like they're very nice, or oh, that person looks like they're dangerous, I better move aside, or oh boy, look, that person must be really dumb or lazy, or oh, that person looks like somebody I would be friends with. All day long, you're making sense assessments about people. You're certainly making assessments about your patients when they walk in. And on, on the street, when people see you pass by, they're making assessments about you. And in the, in the office, when your patients come in, they're making assessments about you too, just based on what you look like. And oftentimes it'll be based on whether somebody told, whether somebody told them about people that look like you or whether they knew somebody that looked like you. If when you were 12 years old, if somebody beat you up on the playground and they have red hair, you may forevermore meet somebody that has red hair and have a feeling like, ooh, something about that person, I can't put my finger on it, but I just don't like them. I'm asking you to become more aware of those things. So where do prejudices come from? Someone told you about those people, you saw them in the movies or on TV, you had a memorable interaction or relationship and you generalized to think all people who look like that are blah, 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 are smart, are lazy, are dangerous, are calm, whatever it is. <clears throat> um, sometimes those kinds of automatic reactions are positive. So for example, my grandma was kind of an overweight Russian lady um, who spoke with a wonderful accent and made great chicken soup. And when I hear somebody that has that accent, I love them automatically. I have this feeling about them, oh, that must be a warm and kind person. <laughs> I just, that's my, my automatic feeling about them. So sometimes these automatic relationships or even these prejudices are, are positive. Okay. <clears throat> so um, prejudice requires a feeling that those people are all the same. When people learn to see the differences among individuals, their prejudices become weaker. So we're going to go on to that in just a minute. But um, let me pause now for when I'd, I'd like to actually breathe. Um, does anybody have anything that they'd like to say? Is anything that you want to put into the chart? Any reactions to this so far? Okay. Um, okay. So prejudice requires a feeling that those people are all the same. Um, so this is something that I really try to fight. So I told you, for example, here, let's just go back for a second, um, that um, I'm trying to manage my prejudice around, around people that have multiple tattoos or piercings. And my tendencies, because it's a prejudice, is to think about these people as if they were all the same. Um, and um, so, so one of the things that really helps when you're trying to manage your prejudices is to get to know individuals. And so I, I make it my business to try to do that. So um, somebody came and fixed my garage door. And um, the fellow that came had a, a, a lots of tattoos. You know, he had a full sleeve and he had tattoos on his neck. And so I feel my reaction is, oh, I'm uncomfortable with that. And I think, oh, he's one of those tattoo people that make me uncomfortable. 
And again, I apologize to the beginning. I am not saying anything bad about him. I am saying something bad about me, that I have those automatic reactions. So I asked him, I said, um, can you tell me something about, you know, I, that the sleeve, what's that about? And so now I remember that I have a feeling that this is a person that's probably like a little dangerous. And he looked at me and said, well, you know, when I was a child, um, or, you know, like a teenager, my mom died and it was really a terrible thing for me. And I wrote a poem for her that for my English class and my teacher thought it was a very good poem. And um, I've always really cherished it. So I had it tattooed on my arm and it just brought tears to my eyes. It wasn't what I expected. It's not what I expected from this heavily tattooed person. And then we got to chat for a little while and I thought, oh, what a lovely human being. And so I actually try to do that now for, for, for prejudices that I have. Um, another one that I have is there's certain regional accents, like parts of the country where if somebody speaks, I have this feeling, oh, that can't, person can't be very smart because they have that accent. Then I actually have this gut reaction, oh, that's not, that person's not very smart because of the accent that they have. And so I, when I have a voice in my head, I don't turn it down. I, I turn the volume up and I say, oh, that's my, that's my prejudice talking to me, telling me that that person's dangerous or that person not smart, but that's just my prejudice talking to me. It has nothing to do with the individual I'm talking to. So um, I see that somebody's written here, when we are interviewing candidates for positions and a candidate presents with a garment that is questionable um, relative to the dress code, how should we approach it? A hoodie, for example. Yeah, I love that you're writing that, that question, Chris. So um, the first thing I'll say about that is to, um, is that you're allowed to have a dress code for work. Um, you know, you're allowed to have a dress code for work. And so you can simply, um, you know, pr present that person with what the dress code is. Um, that's different from making an assessment about who the person is as an in individual, who the, their character is. So what I'm suggesting here is that when I see certain things about people, just as I've been saying, I have an assessment about who they are as a person. Like my gut feeling is, oh, that person's dangerous or that person's lazy or that person's not smart. I'm, uh, what, I, what I'm saying to you is that listen to that voice in your head and then say, thank you for sharing, sit down. And then, then, the, then the question is, is that person that's come in for a job interview in a hoodie, um, you want to try to assess that person based on something other than what they're wearing. Now, maybe this is not a person that's appropriate for the job. Maybe they don't have the skills, maybe they don't, they don't have the, whatever it is that you need them to have. So I'm not saying that you have to hire them. I'm only saying that you should take the time to figure out whether there's something in that person character that um, you're mis misunderstanding. Maybe this is actually a hard worker. Maybe this is a great person. And you could say, we'd like to hire you. We have a dress code here. So I don't know if that answers your, your question or not. Um, I would say um, this that kind of thing happens all the time. I will also say that um, when a family comes in, when you're um, when you when you're assessing a family or um, you know the patient and their family, that you want to as much as possible recognize that you may have the tendency to um, jump to conclusions or make assessments. So um, this is another story that I tell sometimes, which is um, which is about um, a, a family who has not been giving their child medications appropriately. They've, they've got made mistakes and they're, they're making drug errors. And the, the health worker notices that the family doesn't speak English very well and they, they eat funny foods and they dress in clothing that's foreign. And the, the health worker makes the determination that this family is not capable of taking care of the child. And they call in um, Department of so Ch Children and Families or whatever you call it in your State Department of Social Services because they're making the assessment that this family is not competent to care for the child. Contrast that with another family who is similarly not giving medications appropriately to their child. But in this case, the family speaks English, 
is, you know, eating a hamburger or something that's fam familiar to the healthcare provider, dressed in jeans and a t-shirt, and feels like, oh, those, that's my kind of people. In that case, the provider has a gut feeling that, oh, this family just needs further instruction. They need a little bit more guidance as to how to give the medication uh, to their child appropriately. They don't call in Department of Social Services. So I'm not, in this case, I don't know enough about the cases, whether or not in either one, social services should have been called in or not. I'm only saying that it's not fair to make an assessment about a family based on what they look like or whether they speak English as a first language or that. So, um, Again, you know, it's, it's actually a huge um, uh, like a disadvantage to me not to be able to see faces and to see whether I'm boring people or whether this is useful information to me. So if there's anything, any questions or any comments about what I've said so far, even, oh, oh this is useful or, um, you know, this is something that we wouldn't be dealing with, any kind of feedback that you can give me would be just great. <clears throat> okay. So oftentimes what I do is uh, looking at, look at stereotypes. So um, stereotypes are things that um, affect all of us. So um, I apologize. Um, the way that I like to do this is to get people to talk about stereotypes that affect themselves. And I will tell you that I run um, like a little exercise and get people to talk about your stereotypes that might affect them. So for example, I'm female. A stereotype about women is that women cry easily. And that stereotype is probably accurate for me. You know, I probably cry easily, at least compared to most men. Um, another stereotype that I pay attention to is I'm Jewish, and, and the stereotype about Jews is that we're supposed to be good accountants. Um, that is not true for me. There are some Jews that are good accountants. There are some Jews that are, like me, not good accountants. And uh, a stereotype that's uncomfortable related to my heritage is that there's a stereotype of, of Jewish people being cheap, that stereotype is very scary to me, and um, I don't think it's true for me. I don't think I'm cheap, and I think that my family and people that are close to me are not cheap. But I'm sure there are some Jews that are cheap, and I'm sure there are people who are not Jewish who are cheap. So when I, I do this exercise, and again, I apologize if I'm saying anything that makes anybody offended or uncomfortable, but what I usually get are things like, I'm Irish, I don't abuse alcohol. I'm Colombian, I'm not a drug dealer. I'm a black woman, I'm not an angry black woman. I'm uh, an African-American father, I'm a wonderful father and um, spend a lot of time with my kids. I'm um, Italian, no, I have no ties to the mafia, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's actually really um, a, a good experience for people to be able to talk about those kinds of stereotypes that affect them personally. Stereotypes are tough. Um, they, they live in the world. They're, um, they're communicated through movies and through the news. And oh yes, um, one that I get fairly often now is I'm Muslim, I'm not a terrorist. Um, these things are very painful for people and they so sadly are so strong and they're so difficult to get rid of. So um, we'll talk about that more in a moment. <clears throat> um, so I'll say that um, one of the problems with stereotypes is that sometimes they're true. What I mean to say is there are some Jews that are cheap. There are some Colombians that are involved in the drug trade. There are some Irish people that abuse alcohol. There are some black men that are um, absent fathers, etc. There are some Muslims that are terrorists. And there are also some people who are not Jewish that are cheap. There are some men who are not black who are absent fathers. There are some people that um, are not Colombian that are in drug trade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for some reason, historically and through the media, certain groups get saddled with certain stereotypes that are unfortunate. So, for example, in the case of Lily Ramirez, if he had been not been Hispanic, say he had been some other other uh, ethnic group, it's likely that the emergency room physician would not have jumped to the conclusion that he was had, he was um, had had a drug overdose. He would have looked. He would have done 
a broader um, evaluation. So these things happen um, that people make ass assessments based on stereotypes. And the problem is, is that sometimes they're true. So you might meet um, or hear about a Muslim who's a terrorist and then think to yourself, aha, see, they really are that way. Or you might meet somebody that's Jewish who's cheap and who can say, oh, ha, see, they really are that way. Or meet a Colombian who's um, a, a drug trader and say, aha, see, they really are that way. Even if they're the smallest minority. So that thing is called confirmation bias. Beware of confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to pay attention to things that confirm what you already believe. And you ignore the things that are inconsistent with your beliefs. So every time you meet somebody who's Muslim, who is not a terrorist or who is a lovely, hardworking, honest, contributing member of society, for some people, they may think to themselves, eh, that person's an exception. <laughs> and when they hear about a Muslim on, on, on TV who has engaged in some kind of terrorist act, they think, aha, uh -huh, see, that person is confirming what I already believe. So this is true for all of the, all of the stereotypes. There are many, many stereotypes that are ugly out there. Um, I've had people, a beautiful blonde woman in the medical school class stand up and said, people look at me, they assume I'm dumb. They think that blonde women are dumb. And that's a, a stereotype that I have to, I have to live down. Or I've had um, people say, um, unfortunately, people who are obese. I've had people say, I am um, clearly overweight and people think I'm lazy. So um, I bring this up and, you know, and love to have this conversation with people being able to have, dare I say, even an intimate conversation about what it's like to live under those stereotypes. That what I want you to take away from this is that beware of stereotypes and beware of confirmation bias. Um, somebody says here, the bipolar political environment has created enemies amongst families and friends. We have patients who have shared their views with providers and staff with the COVID experience. How do you suggest that we respond when it occurs? Yeah, I thank you for that example, because in some ways, um, politics has become the new racism that it's so divisive um, among people of different political uh, points of view. It's become so ugly and it's also, um, it's also become like any other horrible prejudice where people um, are, are use stereotypes and they, um, they generalize to think, well, all Republicans, not only are they uh, conservatively um, economically conservative, but they also have all of these other beliefs that I don't like. Or all Democrats, um, not only are they economically um, you know, more likely to support social programs or whatever, but they also, they have all of these other characteristics that I don't like. There's a certain kind of homogeneity that we're gonna be talking about. Like those people are all the same. And the issue about political party is uh, is just is like another form of ethnic bias or racism. It's terribly, terribly sad. And remember that individuals are complex and they are they have all kinds of unique characteristics. So not all Republicans are the same. Not all Democrats are the same. Not all independents are there or whatever political party that people belong to. People are nuanced. They have, they have, they're not all the same. And so again, one of the ways for you to fight, um, fight these kinds of biases is to get to know people as individuals. <clears throat> so here, this takes me to in-group heterogeneity and out-group homogeneity. In-group heter heterogeneity, say that um, as a Jewish person, I will say that I can tell you that Jews are very different from one another. Some are very, some are very conservative. Some are very liberal. Some, um, you know, follow like kosher laws very stringently. Some don't pay attention to that at all. Um, there's enormous 
uh, diversity and how Jews feel about the politics of Israel and a lot of um, infighting about that. So Jews are not all the same. We're all very different. And as a Jewish person, I, I know that we're all very different. And I would say that if you're Irish or if you're Polish or if you're Italian or whatever it is, you, would, you will see the enormous variety within your groups. Um, or if you're a doctor, you know, some people who are not doctors say, think that all doctors are the same, have different, have similar personalities or all nurses are the same. Of course, that's not true. And what we tend to do is think about others as the same, outgroup homogeneity. My group, we're all different and unique. Those people are, those people are all the same. All those people of that particular ethnic group, oh, they're all, you know how they are. There's, those people are all the same. There's a tendency to do that. Sociologically, there's a tendency for people to think about other groups as if they were all the same and their own groups as being unique. So again, I warn you or con consult or counsel you to be careful of that. <clears throat> so how do you manage your prejudices? One, be honest with yourself. Ask yourself, where did this prejudice come from? Did somebody with red hair beat, beat me up when I was a kid in the playground? Um, examine the statement, those people are all the same and remind yourself that it's not true. Those people are not all the same. And the fellow that came to fit to fix my garage door that had the, had all the tattoos all over him, he's not the same as any as other people that have tattoos. He's a unique people. They're all unique. And learn about the individuals you meet and intentionally notice people who are different from negative stereotypes. So if you have a, com a, a comfort a discomfort with a, a particular group of people and think that they are shoplifters, or you think that they're terrorists, or you think that they're cheap, or blah, 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 you have a gut feeling, find those people, the many of them, the majority of them, who are different from the stereotypes, and remind yourself, look at that person who is the kind of person that I would like, and um, the kind of person who I like who is very different from the stereotype. <clears throat> so remember that everything you think or say about a cultural group is true of some people in that group and not true of others. Individuals differ based on how they were raised, their personal life experiences, their education, their socioeconomic status, whether they've traveled and the personality they were born with. All right, so um, any any other questions? I'm gonna move on to improving patient adherence. And I, I see that, um, I think I only have like 15 or so minutes left. So let me go as quickly as I can. So um, so what causes somebody to adhere, a patient to adhere to uh, medical advice? They have to understand the plan. They have to have the res resources to follow the plan. They have to be motivated to follow the plan. And that means the patient has to trust the provider. And the patient believes that the provider likes him or her. And, you know, interestingly, there was one study that looked, looked at adherence and it was important for patients to like the provider, but even more importantly, it was important that the patient believes that the provider likes him or her. So if your patient or the parents believe that you don't like them, <laughs> they will be less likely to adhere to medical advice than if they feel like you like them. Um, if the patient feels that the provider listens to them, more than anything else, people want to be less listened to. In fact, you know, there's all of this research on uh, patient provider racial concordance. Like, is that better? Like when patients and providers are of the same racial background, do you get a better outcome? And that has been very, um, it has just ha hasn't been substantiated. In some cases, um, people will say, I really want to have a provider of my race. But uniformly, what people want is they want a provider who listens to them of any race. They want, they want to have the feeling that their provider cares about them, likes them, respects them, and listens to them. That that makes a huge difference even even in how well people adhere to medical advice. Um, and then they have to, the patient has to believe that the benefits of the medication are greater than the costs, and that means the financial costs as well as the side effects. And that the patient has high self-efficacy, meaning that the patient believes that they 
personally can make a difference in their own health outcome or the out outcome of their child, and that they know how to follow the medical plan. So this business of do you understand what we've discussed um, is a terrible way to um, ensure that the patient understood you. It's better to because no one says no. No one says, uh, I have no idea what you just said. People don't have the guts to tell you that. So in, in exam, you know, the example of this, this terrible thing that happened with the syringe. So definitely what, the only way to tell whether patients have understood you is to ask them, please tell me in your own words what it is that you're going to do when you get home. It's not good enough that you give them the instruction. You need to hear it out of their mouths. And if it requires any kind of skill, you do a return demonstration. In the case of the syringe, if the doctor had said, okay, now I would like to observe you actually administering this medication, the, the doctor, the, the father would have put the syringe in the mouth of the baby. The doctor would have said, stop, 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 stop. You have to take the syringe cap off before you put the syringe in the baby's mouth. And that simple thing would have saved the baby's life. <clears throat> so again, can you explain in your own words what you heard? Can you explain in your own words why this treatment is important? And then ask for demonstrations. Show me how you will administer the medicine. Use the inhaler, put drops in their eyes, change the dressing, whatever it is. You need to observe other people doing it. Otherwise, you have no idea what they're going to do when they leave them. And of course, this is, this is, is something that's important for you to do with all your patients. I will say when there are cultural uh, uh, barriers or when there are language barriers, this is even more important. And if you're communicating through uh, an interpreter, then you should ask the interpreter, please ask the patient or the family to explain in their own words what they're going to do. And I want you to interpret exactly what they said so I can determine whether there's a misunderstanding. <clears throat> Take two TWAP tablets twice a day. Um, this was a study done where people were asked to take two tablets twice a day. They were able to respond and say, what are you going to do at home? And they could they could parrot it and they could say, I'm going to take two tablets twice a day. Then when, when there were further questions asked, some people understood that that meant a total of two, that they were going to take one in the morning and one in the evening. So I'm, I only warn you again to make sure that you've sufficiently asked people what it is that they understand. Um, once, take the medicine once. Um, for the Spanish speakers, O-N-C-E is pronounced once, it means 11, and there are examples in which people have taken medication 11 times a day or given 11, the, the medication to their child 11 times a day. Um, obviously, that is, results in a, a tragedy. <clears throat> um, Okay, now I want to talk to you about different um, cultural beliefs about healthcare because I understand that you have uh, patients that come from different parts of the world who may have completely different ideas about health and illness. So um, I did some work in Bolivia, and um, there is a uh, there's a belief in Bolivia about a the Lari Lari cat. Um, the Lari Lari cat is an invisible cat that has no ears or tail. And it comes into your house, and it um, it it, uh, it infects your baby, and it steals the breath of your child. It steals the breath of your child so that the baby starts to sound like a cat meowing, and then um, the the baby the, the the baby can turn blue. So that is an explanation that people have given for child asthmatic asthma. They, they, when they're hearing wheezing, they think it sounds like a cat meowing. And so they assume that this terrible, mythical, lati lati cat has come to their homes and has stolen the child's breath and has replaced that breath with a meow sound. That's their understanding of it. So, um, you can imagine there are some doctors that in encountering that have said to their patients, this is ridiculous and that is not true. Your child has asthma and you need to um, give that child, treat that child with an inhaler. 
Um, part of the story also came because um, apparently if you have a real cat in your house, like a real, not a mythical one, the that invites the scary laddie laddie cat to your house. So they, I, I think what that, that had shown was that people who had real cats in their homes, that who had children that were allergic to cats and it caused them to have um, wheezing, that they, that just created and deepened the story that was shared in this like mountain village of children that apparently had asthma. Um, the way to treat the Ladi Ladi was to take the horn of a cow and put it on your front door because when the Ladi Ladi cat came to your house, it would be impaled on the horn and would protect your child. So this is, you know, work that we had done. Uh, I had actually done some work in, in Bolivia. And the the answer was is to show people respect for what they, they believe. Really, tell me more about the Ladi Ladi cat. And then what happens? And what kind of treatment do you get for the Ladi Ladi cat? Because it almost never works to tell people that belief systems that they've had in their homes or their communities for years, it almost never helps to say, that's not true. And let me explain to you what I learned in medical school about asthma. So they actually, they humored people and they said, you know, what? I think that horn of the cow, a horn of the cow putting that on your door is really important. I think also there's this other treatment that might even make it more effective. Let me show you what this inhaler is. And I think that that will help your child as well as the horn of the cow. And so then that was their way of introducing the um, inhaler or other, you know, other treatments for, uh, for asthma. And they, they built trust, they built a relationship with the family, they didn't make fun of the family, and they um, incorporated the family's beliefs and also introduced the, um, you know, modern medicine. <clears throat> So most people will simply not believe you if you tell them that a traditional practice that has been passed down for generations is wrong. Um, contradicting someone else's beliefs simply shuts off communication. Instead, ask open-ended questions and build trust in order to introduce good health practices. Um, so um, any other, is any, any questions, anything that somebody wants to put in the chat before I, I move on? Okay, so I want to talk to you about, um, also related to this, um, ethnic. So there are, you know, a number of people that have looked at how do you work with people that have different beliefs. And this is a little mnemonic for explanation, treatment, healers, negotiate, inter interventions, and collaborate. It means that when you're trying to establish a relationship with somebody who has a different set of beliefs about healthcare, you want to ask them a lot of questions to understand where they're coming from. And when you've understood where they're coming from, you can then introduce your, your uh, medical advice and it'll be accepted more easily. So some of questions are, what do you call your problem or sickness? What name does it have? And the person would say, well, I this 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 is a lottie lottie cat and it's caused by blah, blah, blah. What do you think caused your sickness? How do your friend, what do your friends or family say about it? What does the sickness do to you? And when you begin to ask these kinds of questions and get a full story, that's when you've established trust that people see that you understand them and you believe, at least you are respecting their beliefs enough to um, engage in a conversation about it. What kinds of medicines or home remedies do you use? And the person would say, well, I put a horn of the cow on, on, the, on the door. <clears throat> And have you sought advice healers? What kind of healers have you worked with? Well, um, my uh, neighbor who is a, a healer in my community told me to do this or X, Y, and Z. And then to negotiate. Okay, I agree with the horn of the cow or I agree with some other traditional healing method, but can we also agree that you're also going to take this medic medicine or give this medicine to your child um, introduce the inhaler or whatever it is. Ne negotiate options that will be mutually acceptable and be, do not contradict, but rather incorporate your patient's beliefs. Now, sometimes this is more difficult. For example, um, I, in, in part of Florida, there was a, a, a community, I think, I think they were Burmese, I think they were from Burma, and they were using um, a, like a traditional medicine to um, 
to treat like respiratory, upper respiratory infections in children. And there was something about that medicine that actually looked like it was effective because sometimes um, traditional medicines actually really are pharmacologically active and they really do um, treat, treat the, the illness. The problem is, is that there's no um, dosage control. There's no, there's no, um, there's no trust. There's no trust as to whether or not it can be harmful. It, there, there's no control for side effects. So in this case, this Burmese medicine looked like it really had something in it that was um, effective in treating upper respiratory infection. Unfortunately, it also had lead in it. So you know, it had been tested in a local lab, and it said, you know what, um, this has got lead in it. And we simply cannot allow these people to administer this medication to their children. It has lead in it. And that was a really difficult thing in the community. And it required lots of, um, you know, um, like negotiation of please explain to me, tell me more about what your understanding is about this upper rest respiratory infection and why this medica medication or why this tr traditional re remedy is working. And, and they got um, members from the that community who were more amenable or more um, educated who could actually persuade members in the community that they could no longer use this medication and they were given you know traditional or rather excuse me modern medications to treat their children but it was it was a difficult thing in the community and what you don't want is you don't want it to go underground meaning that you don't want people to start lying about it um, and if they feel like you are mis making fun of them mistreating them, mistre then, then the whole thing just goes underground. People do it without telling you. And that's that's actually a worse situation. <clears throat> All right. So again, and what, I, what I had here also was um, collaborate. Collaborate with the patient, the family members, anybody in the community who's respected. Um, let me pause. Anything anybody else wants to say about this now? Any suggestions, experiences that you've had? Okay. And again, it's, it's, um, you know, it's unfortunate I can't see you, then I could get a better sense for whether this is useful information. Um, I wanted to say something about evaluating the way in which you're interacting with your patients. So I'm going to give you kind of read through this list for you. And I would really recommend that you think about this list in your interactions with patients and that you, um, you can actually try to, you know, if you were trying to evaluate how well you're working with patients and their families, this is a good tool for doing it. And if, if you're comfortable asking people about their self-identified race or ethnicity or whether they speak English as a first language, then you can stratify the data based on those demographic characteristics. So things like, I feel that my healthcare provider likes me. And as I said earlier, there's a fair amount of evidence that when people feel that their provider doesn't like them, they don't adhere. So you would ask people that question and you know anonymously and get a sense for how that breaks down based on race, ethnicity, whether people speak English as a first language, et cetera. When I don't understand what my healthcare provider says, I ask questions. And that is, a, that is something that all doctors should ask themselves. How would my patients answer that question? Do they ask me questions when they don't understand what I've said? Or do they just nod politely? My healthcare provider understands my concerns about my illness and treatment. So the Ladi Ladi cat, that family, that Bolivian family, you know, they lived in the, they lived in the, the, you know, the highlands of Bolivia, very isolated. But they wanted to feel that their healthcare providers understood their fears about the Ladi Ladi, Ladi cat. My healthcare provider and I have similar goals regarding my health. I talk with my healthcare provider about herbal or natural remedies. And um, um, I, you know, I see that's gonna end in two minutes, but I can just tell you that, for example, in South Florida, there are lots of people that come from Haiti. Almost everybody comes with some kind of medicinal herbal tea that they feel is effective. And um, I was talking with one of the providers in, in, um, in South Florida who had a Haitian patient who had high blood pressure. He just couldn't get it under control. And he kind of had a sense that the, that the woman was not taking her blood pressure um, regularly. And from what I understand in that community, people use herbal remedies, they use herbal teas for 
blood pressure and other illnesses. And he could never establish a relationship with her to convince her to take the blood pressure medicine regularly. And so sadly, that woman was in her 40s and had a stroke and she had uh, children that were you know, underage. And it was a very, he was very sad, sorry about it. And I think, oh, if only I had gotten to him beforehand, and if he could have had a, a conversation with a woman about, well, what's your understanding about blood pressure? And how do you treat it in Haiti? And who are the traditional healers that you talk to? That if he had had that conversation with her, perhaps he could have no negotiated and said, listen, I don't know very much about that herbal remedy, but I think it's important that, that you take this blood pressure medicine as well. And let's, you know, let's see if we can get your blood pressure under control. If it had been like that, that kind of trusting relationship, perhaps she would not have had a stroke. Um, so um, other things, my healthcare provider has the time to talk with me and I know you're all busy, um, but people really, really, it, it's not even only the amount of time you spend, but if you sit down, make eye contact with people and, and show that you've understood what they have to say, they will have the feeling that you've spent more time with them. When I don't agree with my healthcare provider about my illness and treatment, we discuss it. And that's really, really important that people are able to say, I don't feel comfortable with this treatment, or I don't, I don't feel comfortable with what you're saying. It's really important for people to be able to talk to you about that. Otherwise, they're just going to go home and do whatever they do. <clears throat> um, I feel that my healthcare provider respects the group of people I belong to. And in that regard, I, I remind you of, of what we've talked about with, with regarding your own prejudices. Be aware of them. When, when somebody comes in and you're not comfortable with the way they're dressed or what their racial or ethnic background is or whether they have an accent, remind yourself, oh yes, that's my prejudice talking to me. And my job is to get to know that particular individual family, just like I got to know the fellow that was fixing my garage door that had the tattoos. It made me feel differently about him. So um, I don't know, uh, uh, Chris and Dawn, am I am I done? It's it's a, it's an hour out. Should I keep going, or are we going to terminate? Are we going to end? Hi, hi, Gail. Thank you. Yeah, we are approaching the hour, so if um, if there are no other further questions, if you have uh, you have so much good information here, um, if you have something you'd like to offer. A uh, pearl of wisdom, I guess, um, that we can take with us as we venture back to our individual worlds yeah. here. That would be sure, sure. I think, um, yeah, um, I think, I think, really, you know, it's uh, you know, just in in summary, um, don't fool yourself into thinking that you don't have biases because everybody does. Do some, put some effort into figuring out what they are. What gives you that yuck feeling? And when you have it, don't, you want to turn the volume up and say to yourself, oh, that's my prejudice talking to me. But here it is, this family in front of me is, is unique. And if I learn something about them, why do you, why are you here? Or, you know, some, who's your favorite baseball team? When you got, get to learn something individual about people, then you are, you're less likely to do this outgroup um, homogeneity it will remind you that these people are not all the same. And that will help you in terms of establishing a relationship with them. And then lastly, listen, 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 whatever you can do to establish a relationship with people to make them feel that you like them, that you respect them. That will help you engage in conversations with, with patients and their families that will increase the likelihood that they will adhere to medical advice. So I... Gail, that was, that was a wonderful presentation on behalf of MHA. We really do appreciate your time and energy to put this together for us. Sure. Um, I will um, ask the attendees to be sure to fill out your attestation, check with your department head, and get those over to Don so we can check you off. And um, uh, without without any other questions, I, Gail, thank you again for your time, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. You're okay. Signing off. Sure. Okay, then. Bye-bye.